Any questions from the class before we go over the, it's not really a review from last time, it's a review about basic properties of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. <laughs> no basic questions? All right. Everybody knows that Monday and Tuesday of next week is fall break. You know what fall break is? No class, okay? Very good. If not, look it up, okay? Monday and Tuesday. Okay, so if we have a matrix that's n by n with possibly complex entries, we defined an eigenvalue as being a, a number in the complexes such that there exists a non-zero complex vector V satisfying AV equals lambda V. Now, of course, real numbers are complex numbers, real vectors are complex vectors, so it handles um, all of the various cases. That's eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And just as a remark, normally people don't write the parentheses making it super clear what you're talking about on existence, but you know, sometimes it's nice if you do that. There exists a non-zero vector in CN such that. Um, the standard inner product on CNC is X transpose Y complex conjugate. And then the complex conjugate, just write the vector. This is a real vector in RN. This is a real vector in RN plus J. So this is the real part, that's the imaginary part. You just change the sign on the imaginary part to get the complex conjugate. Same for the eigenvalue and eigenvectors. We use this inner product and we take the inner product of a vector with itself. Of course, that's supposed to be the norm squared. Anytime you have a complex number times this complex conjugate, you get the magnitude squared. So it's just the sum of the magnitude squareds of the entries. That's the inner product of a vector with itself. This is homework one written in a just slightly different way. If we take a matrix and divide it up into its columns, and we have another matrix with the same number of columns, and we do B transpose times A, its IJ entry is the ith row of B times the jth column of A. And so that's the inner product of the vector BI and the vector AJ when you take the columns. Okay, so the IJ entry B transpose A is an inner product. We're gonna use that fact in a little bit. Okay, that's not, not too shocking, it's, it's good? Okay. <clears throat> um, you have two complex numbers, you first take their product and then you take their complex conjugate of that. It's the same thing as if you complex conjugates first and then multiply them. So you can just use the definition of complex conjugate and multiplication and check that. So that's just a quick reminder. Okay. And then one more claim, so just, just make a note to come in here and just transfer these to your notes. If a matrix is real and its eigen is real and square, then its eigenvalues and eigenvectors always occur in complex conjugate pairs. So if you're not familiar with that, I've got the proof here and it just, so. We won't go through it, but it just uses the fact that the complex conjugate of products is products of complex conjugates. Okay, so if a matrix is real, even though the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are not necessarily real, they do occur in complex conjugate pairs. If lambda is an eigenvalue, so is its complex conjugate, and the corresponding eigenvector is V complex conjugate. 
So, just useful facts about matrices. Questions? Don't look too hard, those facts. That's all we need to derive everything today, basically. Sound good? We're not doing abstract inner product spaces today. We're doing symmetric real matrices. Mm. Okay, so just quick definition, and then we're going to get into this definition. And N by N matrix A is symmetric if A equals A transpose. <clears throat> Okay, our big result is going to be that every symmetric real matrix can be diagonalized. It's every real symmetric matrix, its eigenvalue, eigenvectors are orthogonal. So we'll be able to diagonalize real symmetric matrices using orthogonal matrices, and orthogonal matrices are simply a matrix that each of its columns is orthogonal to all of the others, and we'll have that matrix be full rank. Okay, so we'll make all these things uh, clear, but that's what we're going after. So today we're actually going to um, need to use the complex inner product that we just reviewed, but then we'll find out that when we're working with real symmetric matrices, it's not. Um, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are real. So here's our first claim. If A is real and symmetric. So real. A is equal to its complex conjugate, that's how it's real. Symmetric. Okay, then for any pair of vectors in CN, The inner product of AX with Y is equal to the inner product of X with AY. Okay, we can swap pre-multiplying by A and just move it over here to Y if we want. Okay, so that's our first little claim. Looks completely innocent, and it is, but it's very helpful, okay? Okay, so let's just look at the proof. So the inner product of AX with Y is X transpose A transpose Y complex conjugate. But that's equal to X transpose A Y complex conjugate And that's because A equals A transpose. Now, let's just write it more simply. We're using A equals A transpose here. Okay, so if, when A is symmetric, it's equal to its transpose. Okay, fine. So that's where we've used A symmetric. Maybe we need to use A is real. Let's check that. So if we do the inner product of X, with A times Y, that's X transpose 
times a y complex conjugate okay so that's just x transpose a complex conjugate times y complex conjugate because the complex conjugate of a product is the product of the complex conjugate for scalars and when you work all that out for matrix multiplication you get exactly the same property okay and that equals x transpose a times y complex conjugate because a is real that's a transpose okay so that shows that those two quantities are equal. So we can move the A around and we get the same result, X transpose Y. Even I'm embarrassed. I don't know if it's any better, but that's what we got. Okay, so that's our first little claim. So just the property of real symmetric matrices, that inner product is very nice in terms of moving A around. So claim two is that eigenvalues of real symmetric matrices are real. Okay, so we know in general, real matrices don't have necessarily real eigenvalues. They can be complex. 0, 0, minus 1, 0, for example, has eigenvalues j and minus j. That matrix is real, but it's not symmetric. Okay, so let's just see what goes on here. So, to show if a V equals lambda V, V not equal to zero, then <clears throat> lambda equals lambda complex conjugate. Okay, I want to show lambda is real, so it should be equal to its complex conjugate. Okay, so we're going to use this result up here, AXY equals XAY. So we're going to now apply claim one with X equals Y equals V. So let's see what we get if we do that. Well, we get the inner product of A times V with V equals the inner product of V with A times V. Huh. That looks completely unhelpful on the surface. But what do we have here? This is lambda V because A times V V is an eigenvalue. V is an eigenvector with eigenvalue lambda. And this is V times lambda V. Okay. Now, on the left-hand side, when I pull out a constant, I get just the constant. On the right-hand side, remember, I don't have linearity. I have complex conjugate symmetry when I pull that out. I get lambda complex conjugate times the inner product of V with V.
remember, this is V transpose lambda complex conjugate V complex conjugate transpose. Okay, so that's why the lambda complex conjugate. Okay, so this is lambda times the norm of V squared equals lambda complex conjugate norm of V squared. So we conclude that lambda equals lambda complex conjugate, and that's because the norm of V squared is non-zero. Too elegant, right? I wish it were my proof. It's not, okay? Okay, we take V an eigenvector, and we just take the fact when A is real and symmetric, we can move it from the left-hand side to the right-hand side and not change anything in Cn. C, V is an eigenvector, V is an eigenvector, linearity on the left, linearity with complex conjugate on the, when you do it on the right, norm V squared, norm V squared, V is an eigenvector, it's non-zero, hence lambda equals it's complex conjugate. Conclusion, lambda is real. Bingo. Hmm. <clears throat> okay, so if the eigenvalues of a real symmetric matrix are real, what about the eigenvectors? Hmm. How do we find eigenvectors? I think I can reboot. Fix this. There we go. Okay, so if lambda is an eigenvalue, it's real. A is real. Identity is real. This is a real matrix. We're looking for a solution in the null space of this matrix. Now, you can take V as a real vector, and then you could put a J in front of it, and it's still true. So you're not obliged to take the eigenvectors to be real, but you always can, is the point, okay? So, so we can assume eigenvectors. Okay, we don't have to, but we always do. So when A is real, its eigenvalue is real, you would always take the real solution, though, of course, you don't have to. J times V is a perfectly good um, eigenvector as well. 1 plus J times V is another perfectly good eigenvector, but they're all the same. So we just take the real solution. Okay. Questions so far? Seem too abstract? Seems like the level's way down compared to normal? That's okay. That's okay. Today's easy. We're on easy street. Claim three. So this is where it gets interesting. The eigenvectors of symmetric real matrices are orthogonal. Okay, so we're going to do in class the case when the eigenvalues are distinct, and then next 
homework, you guys will play with the case where the eigenvalues are repeated, and you'll see that it works just the same. So we're going to do the easy case here. Come on. We assume lambda 1, lambda n are distinct here. General case is treated in homework. Okay, so this is the result you want to remember though. Eigenvectors of symmetric real matrices are orthogonal. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take lambda 1 not equal to lambda 2 because we're doing the case when they're distinct. We'll take two vectors, v1 and v2, both of them non-zero. And we're going to assume AV1 equals lambda 1 V1, AV2 equals lambda 2 V2. And then we're going to show that their inner product has to be zero. Can you see it? I mean, just because the eigenvalues are distinct, the eigenvectors are orthogonal? The answer is, I can't see it, okay? Maybe you can. But it's all going to follow from this claim one, okay? So this really innocent looking AXY equals XAY when A is real and symmetric, okay? So we're going to apply Claim one with x equals v1 and y equals v2. Okay, so what does that mean? It means if we have a v1 and v2. That is equal to V1, A, V2. So that's claim one. A times X with Y in a product is the same thing as X, A times Y. Okay, well, that seems innocent enough. So that's lambda one, V1 with V2, and that equals V1 lambda 2 with V2. We're just using that they're eigenvalues and eigenvectors, okay? Whoops, that's claim one. This is, we're using that they're eigenvectors. <laughs> now, Lambda 2 is real, lambda 1 is real, because we've already shown that eigenvalues and eigenvectors of some real symmetric matrices are real. So when we take lambda 1 out, we just get lambda 1, and now when I take lambda 2 out, I just get lambda 2. There's no complex conjugate anymore. So I get lambda 1, inner product, V1, V2, equals lambda 2 inner product v1, v2. We're using lambda 2 real. Okay, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, real. Well, 
This means lambda 1 minus lambda 2 times the inner product of v1 to v2 is 0. I won't write a reason over here. It's called arithmetic, OK? <laughs> But now we get the inner product of v1 and v2 is 0, and the reason is that lambda 1 is different than lambda 2. Okay. So lambda 1 minus lambda 2 is non-zero. This product is 0, so this term has to be 0. So the eigenvectors are orthogonal. Bingo. Done. Okay, so why don't you make a star by claim one because everything follows from that, okay? So you might want to know claim one, okay? This looks totally innocent, but once you use claim one and just make good choices for X and Y, everything just follows for real symmetric matrices from inner product AX with Y is the same thing as the inner product with AX and AY, with X and AY, okay? Claim one is like, Superstar, okay? Claim one is a superstar. Innocent, and yet it gives you that the eigenvalues of a real symmetric matrix are real. We can always take the eigenvectors are real, and now it gives you that the eigenvectors are orthogonal. Okay, questions so far? Everybody knew this? I never knew it when I was in your your stage, okay? I didn't learn that till I was a professor, I think. And I needed it sometime. No one ever bothered to tell me, and I didn't need it in any of the work I was doing. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna now get set up to do a really simple version of the singular value decomposition. I'll make that comment more precise in a second. So definition, an n by n real matrix Q is orthogonal if Q transpose times Q equals the identity matrix. Okay, so let's just break this down into columns of Q. And then you guys will see where all of this comes together. Q1, Q2, Qn. So I've taken Q into its columns. And then you guys remember this result. Q transpose Q ij element is equal to the inner product of the ith column of q with the jth column of q. Okay, so that was that a transpose b result we had. So this is the inner product of the ith column and the jth column. There's an i there somewhere. Okay. Okay, so Q transpose Q equals the identity means that QIJ is equal to zero for I not equal to J, and it's equal to one when I equals J. Okay, so how should we choose the columns of Q then? They form an orthonormal basis for Rn, okay? So that's the whole thing of an orthogonal matrix. It's super special. 
How many of us would love to calculate the inverse of this matrix Q? <laughs> yes. Okay. We can do the transpose. Okay. So the, if your matrix is orthogonal, the inverse is just the transpose. And the secret to being an, ortho, an orthogonal matrix is that the columns are an orthonormal basis for Rn. Okay. Okay. So this equals one i equals j zero i not equal to j if q transpose times q equals the identity. Okay. Excuse me. I think you wrote i not equal to j twice. I wrote I not equal to J twice. What did I write there? We don't know. All right. Oh, interesting. I equals J. There we go. Okay. Columns of Q are an ortho normal basis of Rn. Okay, so that's just a concept of an orthogonal matrix. <clears throat> okay, so if we have a real symmetric matrix around, where might we find an orthonormal basis for Rn. We just use the eigenvalues and I excuse me, the eigenvectors, okay? So the eigenvectors are orthogonal. We can always normalize them to make them length one. So we just take the eigenvectors of our real symmetric matrix and we get an ortho we get an orthogonal matrix. Okay, so claim four. Four. Whoops. Yep. Definition. Scroll up a little bit. Yeah. You say Q is orthogonal. Mm -hmm. So the definition of a matrix being orthogonal means that the columns have to be orthogonal. The definition of a matrix being orthogonal is that the matrix pre-multiplied by its transpose is the identity. That's the definition. What does it mean? Just break this down into the columns of Q. And we've looked at the ij element of A transpose times B. So, okay, so we just take A equals B. So now we have A transpose A. So it's Q transpose A. And so we get the ith column of A and the jth column of B. That's the inner product. So that's QI and QJ. And so if this is the identity, the ij elements have to satisfy this when you do get the equal sign here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I understand this. So they're equal to 1 if i equals j if those two columns are, the column is orthogonal, right? Oh, okay. So this is what I understand. Okay, I think I get it now. So we say two vectors are orthogonal if their inner product is zero, and but then, then we talk about orthonormal having length one, correct? Okay, so one does not call this an um, orthonormal matrix. It's not called that, okay? So it's just the definition that people have adopted in the case of matrices. The matrix is said to be orthogonal if it's Q transpose Q is identity. It's an unfortunate term because it doesn't have the length of the columns being one. So a matrix of orthogonal vectors, vectors is not orthogonal. orthogonal. Okay. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> That's where I was yeah, I, I get it. Okay. I'm so the yeah, so the confusion is if a matrix is orthogonal, it does mean that the ortho the columns are orthogonal, but it also means more. They also have to have length one. Yeah. It's confusing, but we cannot make up just a nice vocabulary for Rob 501 and then you go someplace else and people treat you like an idiot because you're not using the same vocabulary that they're using, okay? Totally get it. 
Totally get it. This is not my bad, okay? So this is just the field of matrices, okay? So the columns of an orthogonal matrix are orthonormal. So underline the normal part, okay? So the norm of QI squared equals inner product QI QI has to equal 1 for uh, orthogonal matrix. Okay, I'm going to reboot because this thing is writing poorly and it's always because I haven't rebooted recently. Okay. So you guys have a few minutes just to chat. Come up with some more interesting questions on that bingo. Yeah. Let me restart. It'll take long. So if you want to be thinking ahead, think about taking a matrix and, and its eigenvectors and turning it into a diagonal matrix by a change of basis, okay? There we had M inverse A, M equals diagonal. But if M is orthogonal, what's its inverse? It's M transpose, so. And if you've ever seen an SVD, we're, we're sitting right on top of one. Okay, singular value decomposition. Let's see. <coughs> Let's see. Anybody uh, go out and see the fourth remake of A Star is Born over the weekend? No? Only old people went to see the remake of A Star is Born? Okay. Um, I had a good time. I mean, anybody else seen Leaving Las Vegas? You know, walk, watching people that are drunk when that's the big theme of the movie just gets depressing after a while, okay? So um, Bradley Cooper was a little depressing at the end, okay? So that's the uh, giveaway. But he's hanging out with Lady Gaga, right? So, okay. Talk to Papa. Come on. Okay, let's see if this writes better. Or maybe I will just write better. I had a break. Oh, now my pen is unpaired. Life is super hard. Oh, we got it back. Okay. Okay, so orthogonal matrix, nothing to do with orthogonality, everything to do with ortho, orthonormality, okay? Now, if we have a matrix that's real and symmetric, its eigenvectors are orthogonal. So if we normalize them and stack them up as columns, we get an orthogonal matrix. So our next claim for 
Well, yeah, that's writing much better. <laughs> is writing worse? Okay. It's nice when it works perfectly in my office and I come down here and it messes up, okay? So, um, claim if A is real and symmetric, exist an orthogonal matrix Q such that Q transpose A times Q equals lambda equals <laughs> diagonal. Okay, so it's, it's similar, A is similar to a diagonal matrix, and the similarity transform is an orthogonal matrix. Okay, so We assume the eigenvalues are distinct. Okay. See homework for general case. Okay, so as soon as the eigenvalues are distinct, we have linearly independent eigenvectors. Orthogonals because A is real and symmetric. That was claim three. W L O G. You'll, you'll want to use this in a paper for sure. Okay? So without loss of generality. W L O G. I guess I should have capitalized the loss too. We can assume these guys have length one for one less than I less than N. See why this is true? We don't have to, we can assume the length is one. If they're independent, are any of these zero? No. And so we can, if we scale an eigenvector by a constant, it's still an eigenvector. So we each divide each one by their length so that the length is one. Okay. Hence, Q equals V1. V2 dot 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 Vn is an orthogonal matrix. What's happening here? Let me see if another pen will work better. Please tell me that you're already paired. 
Ah, not the pen. Is it me? Okay. Q is orthogonal. Now that's me. Oh, the eraser's not working. And this was supposed to be the easiest lecture of the term. Yep. Just imagine it's you up here, okay? You're going like it would, nothing would ever go wrong if I'm up here. I know, I know how you guys are. When I was a, a student, I thought, ah, come on, it must be easy to be a prof, right? Given this lecture five times or something and all of that stuff. Okay, so, so there's Q. It's orthogonal. Okay, and then A times Q is A times V1, V2, dot, 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 Vn. I'm going to skip one step. A times an eigenvector is the eigenvalue times the vector. Equals, equals. Okay. Okay, I'll skip another step. Since we've done this before when we were doing it with, we called this matrix M the modal matrix. We took V1 to Vn and stacked them up. Okay, lambda is the diagonal. So con conclusion, Q inverse times A times Q is lambda, but Q inverse equals Q transpose, hence we are done. Okay, so real symmetric matrices are similar to a diagonal matrix. That's a similarity transformation via an orthogonal matrix. So the other way to write this is that A equals Q times lambda times Q transpose. Okay, so every real symmetric matrix Right, I have Q transpose multiplied by Q transpose on the left, Q transpose on the right. This is what I get. Every real symmetric matrix looks like an orthogonal matrix times a diagonal matrix times an orthogonal matrix. <clears throat> the singular value decomposition has, this is still a diagonal matrix, these two are still orthogonal, but they're not equal, okay? This will be a U transpose, and this will be a V. Now, let's, let's note this, why orthogonality is cute, okay? Why orthogonal matrices are interesting okay. what's the two norm of q times x we'll square it to make it easy okay well it's x transpose q transpose Q times X, right? 
that's the identity. So that's x transpose x. So that's the two norm of x squared. Okay, so if you multiply a vector times an orthogonal matrix, what did it do to the length of the vector? Nothing doesn't change the length, okay? So if orthogonal transformations don't change the length of the vector, what must they change? It's orientation, right? Okay, that's the only thing it can change. Okay, so only thing left to change. Now, why is that interesting? If I draw these two vectors, and I asked you if they're linearly independent, what would you tell me? Yeah, they're not parallel, right? So they're independent. But are they very independent, or are they almost dependent? Okay, so as this angle gets closer and closer and closer, you'd want to say that they're numerically dependent, okay? So it's obvious if you see this picture. Now, so this is obviously numerically close to being dependent. So it'd be nice if you had kind of, you know, not just that two vectors are linearly independent. When you're doing calculations, you'd be kind of unhappy if this was the columns of your matrix and you have to invert them in your algorithm, okay? Because it starts becoming very dicey when you take the inverse of things that are super close together. So now here, pay attention. Now, what about this matrix? What do you think about their independence, the columns? What's the, what's the determinant of this matrix? It's not even close to zero, right? It's one. Okay. Now look at this. Okay, I'm gonna add zero. 10 to the minus 2, 0, 0 to it, okay? What do I get? 1, 10 to the minus 2, 100, 1. Okay? I did my determinant. A is invertible. Right? Now, I could have made that 1,000, and then I'd made this 10 to the minus 3. Okay? So whatever your numerical precision is, put that here, then put the inverse there. Determine it's still 1. What do you see? What you think is a nicely invertible matrix, plus a small, small perturbation, and the matrix becomes singular. Okay? So that's, that's bad. So this is small delta. Now it's singular. And this one has determinant equals to 1. And, you know, we've always been told, look at the determinant of a matrix if you want to see it's invertible. The answer is, yes, that is a theorem. Okay? A has an inverse if and only if its determinant is not equal to zero. But you need something deeper to understand if with small perturbations I can turn a matrix into something that is, is easily made singular. And if your algorithm has an inverse in it, 
And with a small little mistake in the calculations, it becomes singular, then your code just blows up and your robot crashes and you look stupid in the demo and all sorts of things, right? Okay, so. Let's go over here when A is symmetric. And so these orthogonal matrices, they're super robust, right? Their columns are orthogonal and they have length one. So there's, they're far from being not invertible, okay? I just take the matrix and I take its transpose. These matrix are super nicely um, behaving in terms of numerical calculations. So now the inverse of this matrix, it all boils down to the eigenvalues of A, right? So if this thing has an eigenvalue that is close to zero, now I see that it's really a big problem here. If later we can write all matrices as an orthogonal transformation times a diagonal transformation times a different orthogonal transformation, we can understand when all matrices are easily perturbed away from being zero, not necessarily when they are symmetric or not. That's called the singular value decomposition, and this diagonal matrix are the singular values. Okay, if you've heard of principal components analysis, PCA, the principal components are the eigenvectors here, and these are the weights on them. The big eigenvalues are the important pieces of the data. The small eigenvalues are kind of the noise in the data. Okay, you're getting the big part of the data that's linearly independent. The rest of it is, the rest of it so if there's a, you know, 100, 100, 10 to the minus 6, okay, the matrix is invertible, but one of the columns is a linear combination of the other up to a small perturbation. It's not a perfect linear combination, okay? So that's what the singular value decomposition or principal components does. And so when A is real and symmetric, we've just done that, and it all followed from... AX inner product Y equals inner product X AY, okay? That formula gave you the singular value decomposition when A is real and symmetric. You impressed? No. Wouldn't want to show that. Okay. Okay, so. Later will lead to SVD equals singular value decomposition. So it's really important for numerical computation. Okay, equals numerical method. to check the rank of a matrix, et cetera. Okay, yes, the columns are linearly independent, but if I just put the smallest little perturbation that my uh, round off error in my computer causes, they're no longer independent. I'd like to detect that, okay? And so that's the SVD. Cool. Now, just as an observation, okay, A transpose A and A times A transpose are both symmetric. Okay, so the SVD of a, of a general matrix A comes from exploiting the fact that these two things are symmetric. So those are automatically symmetric no matter what A is, and we can do this decomposition and that will lead to it. Okay. Questions? Is that a question? Yeah. <laughs> so, if you go up to the uh, A equals 
This one? Uh, yeah, Q, not Q. So, yeah. Um, Q is a matrix of the Eigen, Eigen They're the eigenvectors of A. A is real and symmetric. We built Q out of eigenvectors and we normalized them to length one so that Q is orthogonal. If we don't have that property, then Q times Q transpose on the diagonal has the norm of the eigenvector squared. Well, if they're orthogonal, then that, that set of eigenvectors can make like a basis for R n. Right? Yep. Yeah, so you can derive this result from the change of basis theorem. Is that what you're trying to get at? Yeah, so if, if I replace that Q with another matrix that has uh, eigenvectors that no, uh, that has the columns as uh, another basis. Oh yeah, then this is not true. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, we use the fact. Yeah, you can't just use any basis. We use the fact that A times the basis elements is lambda times the basis elements. So they're eigenvectors. We use that fact, okay? And then we use the fact that the length of these is one to get Q inverse equals Q transpose. So it's, it's a very special basis. Okay. So in many, 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 many applications, go back to this formula. Um, this is what we care about, okay? These guys are orthogonal, they're super nice. It's when this has big elements and tiny elements that we know we are in trouble. If we had zeros, we know that the rank of A is not full, right? If lambda is all zeros, A is all zeros, okay? So this SVD will not depend upon A being invertible or anything, okay? Um, this doesn't depend upon A being invertible. We can have zero eigenvalues, but if you want to understand the linear independence of the columns of A, it's all in this information here. And if we have 100, 100, 100, 10 to the minus three or two, like our example, we know one of the columns is almost a linear combination of the other two or three. Okay, so the numerical rank of A is less than the column span. And so that's, that's what becomes important. And so the fact that we have a type of transformation that does not change the length of the vector, it's helping us detect the angle when that's a problem. And that small angle shows up in the fact that a really small perturbation will render this thing singular. Okay, and we see that A has columns that are almost dependent when these are all non-zero, but some of them, the ratio is very different. Yes? Sorry, but that depends which direction. What direction? Yeah, like if you had that kind of part of the matrix. Why? Oh, you mean the example I gave? Yeah. Yeah, I could come up with a different example and put a hundred down here too, and everything would look fine. Yes, but this is what this, yes, I could put a delta here and it does not change the rank, okay? But what is the smallest perturbation I can add to this matrix to make it singular? That's telling you the distance of this matrix from one that has determinate zero. Think about that, that's pretty cool. What is the distance of the matrix from being singular? It's pretty cool, okay? This is the smallest perturbation, we'll show that later, that you can add to this matrix and make it singular. I changed the rank. Okay. Claim five. 
eigenvalues of A transpose A and A times A transpose are non-negative. Okay, they're not just real, they're non-negative. So the eigenvalues of A transpose A greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so if I get a matrix, so this matrix is symmetric, this matrix is symmetric, it automatically has the property that its eigenvalues cannot be minus one, minus five, they cannot be negative. It can be zero, if A is a zero matrix, A transpose A, all of its eigenvalues is zero. They can be zero, but they're non-negative. Non How do you prove that? That V, B, and eigenvector of A transpose A, and let V not be equal to zero. So A transpose A times V equals lambda V. V transpose A transpose A times V is lambda V transpose times V. So let's multiply each side of that equation by V transpose. So this is the norm of AV squared, and that's lambda times the norm of V squared. So this is non-negative, this is positive, so lambda is non-negative, okay? And norm V is strictly greater than zero, bingo. Okay, so now I want to get into what, what are other real symmetric matrices that have non-negative eigenvalues, okay? So, this is going to get us into quadratic forms. What we're doing is we're building toward estimation problems where some measurements are more certain than others. Okay, so right now we're treating the error such that everything is the same. So let me just go back to the beginning with our standard norm. So if this is Rn, forget about the complex conjugate transpose, it's just the sum of the squares. And so suppose this is the estimation error we put here. E equals x minus x hat. And it's the sum of all the, com all the components of the error are being treated the same. Well, that's stupid if you have some measurements that are much more precise than others. You want your error to reflect that you put a heavier weight on errors that occur 
with data that's very certain, and when the data is very uncertain, you ignore the errors that thing is causing, okay? So you need weights that are not equal. So that's what we're heading towards, okay? So, so we need matrices that allow us to have need unequal hang in there on <laughs> our error terms. Okay. So let M be N by N and real. Let X be an RN. Okay. I'm going to take X transpose MX. I'm going to write this as M plus M transpose over 2 plus M minus M transpose over 2 times X. M over 2, M over 2, that gives me M. M transpose over 2 minus M transpose over 2, so the transpose thing is gone, right? Okay, so this matrix is symmetric. Okay. So what this matrix? Is it symmetric? What if I transpose this term, what do I get? I get M transpose minus M, which is the negative of this term. So the transpose of this matrix is minus the matrix. Those are called skew symmetric, okay? They have a special name. Skew symmetric. M transpose over 2 transpose <coughs> equals minus M minus M transpose over 2. Okay, so this thing is just equal to X transpose M plus M transpose over 2 times X plus X transpose, and then I've got this M minus M transpose over 2 times x. So this is a scalar, and this is a scalar. Now, if I transpose a scalar, what do I get? The same scalar back and I transpose this one, what do I get? I get it's negative. How many scalars do you know that are equal to their negative? Only zero, okay? So this term is zero. For every single matrix M, this term is zero. Okay, because it's skew symmetric. Okay, so please, please, please listen. If I ever form X transpose MX, it only depends on the symmetric part of M. Okay? The skew symmetric part goes away. So, whenever we write down a quadratic form, 
you always start with M being symmetric. You get nothing more general by putting in one, two, three, four, because it's just equal to M plus its transpose over two. It's just equal to the symmetric part, okay? So, okay. This is the symmetric part of M. Pointing to the whole term or just the um, plus transpose over two? Excuse me? Where was that coming from? Yep. Is that arrow pointing to the whole term or just the M plus M transpose? M plus M transpose over two. Yeah. Okay. So when we form X transpose MX, we Always start with M symmetric, okay? I emphasize this because, I mean, there's many of us in here who always like to have the most general form that we can write down for X transpose MX, okay? The most general thing you can get here is starting with M symmetric because of this fact, okay? This is zero, it's just a symmetric part of M, so don't even start with one, two, three, four. Do one, two, three, four, plus it's transpose over two. Okay, so based upon that, we say definition. A real symmetric matrix P is positive definite if for every X in RN X transpose PX, excuse me, every X in RN, X not equal to zero. X transpose PX is positive. Okay. So, let's go back to this result. P is real and symmetric. I do X transpose X here. Can we do this mentally? And I get X transpose and X, okay? So this is just a, a Y transpose and a Y, right? When is X transpose PX going to be positive for all possible choices of X? These are the eigenvalues. If any one is negative, just make sure that Q transpose times X is that eigenvector, and then you get a negative number, or if it's zero, okay? So, theorem. Theorem, a symmetric, this is our last result for today. A symmetric matrix P is positive definite if and only if all of its eigenvalues are positive. It's an exercise. Okay. Remark. Homework zero two. 
you proved using Lagrange multipliers something interesting. Okay, you proved this. For every x in Rn, if the norm of x, this was the two norm, was equal to one, then x transpose px is greater than or equal to lambda min norm one, so I can just do this, lambda min, and it was less than or equal to <coughs> lambda max. Okay? So that's just another way to see this, because this x being scaled to have length one, that doesn't have anything to do with the positivity. And you can see that the lower bound, and it's tight when you take x to be an eigenvector, it's the smallest eigenvalue. So if that's negative, then x transpose px can be negative, et cetera. Okay? So the smallest eigenvalue has to be positive. But the other way to prove it is just to use this decomposition of p Q lambda Q transpose, and if you want to put a transpose here and get rid of this, it's just a, a different Q, and then X transpose PX and use this result. It's got the eigenvalue sitting right there. Okay, so that's how you can prove that. So to check if a matrix is positive definite, in principle, we have to check its eigenvalues. Okay, so that's painful. So we're going to work on Thursday of getting much better ways of checking that matrices are positive definite. And the reason is when P is positive definite, this is a perfectly fine inner product on Rn. So we can apply all of our projection theorems, all of our normal equations, et cetera. And this will allow us to weight some components of X really heavily and some components of X much more small. Okay. And this will get us into um, covariance matrices and all sorts of things. So that's where we're going. Okay, that's it. Sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs>